Do you know, anatomically modern human beings have existed for over 200,000 years, while private property and class society have only existed for less than 5% of that time. And that's generously including slave society and feudalism. Capitalism's only been around for a few hundred years. And yet, the power of our society is such that it can completely brainwash us into believing that something that we've been doing for less than 0.5% of humanity's existence, capitalism, this system that's literally destroying our planet, is human nature. Now, just think about that for a second. This system that we're engaged in, which has been completely alien to us for over 99.5% of humanity's existence, is human nature. How in the holy feck have we managed to accept such a ridiculous notion as simply being common sense? This is where the Marxist analysis comes in and shines a light on society's base and its superstructure. So, what is the base? What is the superstructure? How do they relate to one another? And what does this all mean for the struggle towards stateless, classless, moneyless society moving forward? Sit tight and we're going to find out. Welcome to Socialism 101, a series designed to help educate people with no prior knowledge on the basics of socialism and communism from an ML and MLM perspective with short and easily digestible videos. If this sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and hit subscribe and turn on the notification bell below. If you'd like to support Marxist educational content, then toss a euro or a dollar per month over on Patreon to help keep this series going. If you're not in a position to support financially, you can help out a lot by just sharing these videos around on social media. Now, it's rare that Marx ever clearly lays out the specific aspects of his theoretical work. We're usually just left with fragments here and there that we have to patch together and work out for ourselves. But in the footnotes of the first chapter of Capital Volume 1, Marx surprisingly provides a brief overview of the concept of base and superstructure. He writes that the economic structure of society is the real basis on which the juridical and political superstructure is raised and to which definite social forms of thought correspond that the mode of production determines the character of the social, political and intellectual life generally. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that statement, so let's take this piece by piece. First looking at the economic structure, the base, then the superstructure that it gives rise to. Then we'll dive into how they interact with one another and how Marxists can proceed towards communism with this knowledge. Now, the base of society is comprised of the mode of production. This might be slave society's slave-owning mode of production, feudalism's feudal mode of production, capitalism's capitalist mode of production, or communism's communist mode of production. The mode of production within society is comprised of two key aspects. One, the productive forces, and two, the relations of production. Productive forces refer to labor and the means of production. Labour here refers to both the individual act of engaging in work as well as the collective labour force. Under the capitalist mode of production, workers sell their labour power, their ability or capacity to do work for a given period of time, to capitalists. Means of production refers to everything that's required to produce, including instruments of production, like the tools, machinery and buildings in which we carry out our work, as well as subjects of production, which includes natural materials like iron ore and also materials that have been filtered through previous labour like that iron ore in its extracted form, which we call raw materials. So those are the productive forces. The other equally important aspect of society's base is the relations of production. As the name implies, this refers to how people relate to the process of production. Under capitalism, this would generally be as a worker or as a capitalist, a member of the proletariat or a member of the bourgeoisie. In other words, the relations of production refer to the systems of class or social class that exist within the given mode of production. Now, from this economic base emerges a societal superstructure which in turn helps to maintain that base. This includes repressive state apparatuses like the military and police, which the ruling class use to secure and maintain their class domination and the current economic order through physical force. This is legitimized ideologically through the system of law that's created to reinforce the relations of production. For example, the bourgeoisie creating laws that protect the right to freely purchase private property and the means of production. And also, the political system that it has in place. Now, the bourgeoisie can generally work quite effectively through liberal democracy. But when private property is challenged by organised labour and the threat of socialist revolution looms, they may resort to implementing fascist measures or even dissolve liberal democracy completely into a full-on totalitarian, corporativist, fascist regime in order to maintain the capitalist economic base. 
Aside from open and explicit politics, religion is another important ideological apparatus of the superstructure as we saw for example how Christianity was effective in helping to maintain monarchy historically, think divine right of kings, in order to maintain particular relations of production. Perhaps most importantly, the superstructure contains the very ideology which maintains the economic base, the ideology of capitalism being liberalism, that is liberalism in the classical sense of the term. And this ideology is reflected in the superstructure's art, culture and media, especially that which is disseminated to the masses by the powers that be. The education system too is hugely important in reinforcing ruling class ideology, and it also serves to prepare people to fulfil the roles required of them in order to maintain the mode of production. And this is all made possible of course by the family, that is, the patriarchal monogamous family unit that facilitates inheritance and the accumulation of private property across generations as well as the reproduction of labour. In sum, the superstructure refers to all parts of society that are not directly part of the productive process. And we can see how, in the superstructure's totality, through a million different ways comprising both directly repressive state force and ideological control, it creates these societal norms that make the economic base appear to simply be common sense, or the natural order of things. In essence, it works to manufacture the consent of the masses in order to maintain the particular mode of production. This is the power of the superstructure. Okay, so now we know that the base refers to the mode of production, including the productive forces and the relations of production, and the superstructure refers to all other aspects of society that aren't directly part of the production process, such as repressive and ideological state apparatuses, the law, religion, the family, the media, art, culture, etc. But we now need to look at the relationship between these two aspects of society. While it is the case that the economic base determines the superstructure in the final instance, it shouldn't be assumed that this is generally just a one-way system. Rather, the base gives rise to the superstructure, which then reinforces the base, which in turn reinforces the superstructure, and so on and so forth in a reciprocal circular pattern. Engels himself pushed back against the notion of an economically deterministic, one-way linear relationship from the base and to the superstructure. Writing in 1890, Engels stated that according to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Other than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. The economic situation is the basis, but the various elements of the superstructure also exercise their influence upon the course of the historical struggles, and in many cases preponderate in determining their form. Unfortunately, there are mechanical materialists who don't understand this and erroneously believe that simply transforming the economic base is enough to solve all of society's ills. That there's no need for struggle at the superstructural level because everything flows in one direction from base to superstructure. The real world consequence of this is that many of the daily struggles faced by the oppressed that don't directly pertain to the base and its relations of production, the struggle between proletarian and bourgeois, may be ignored. For example, state forces disproportionately enacting violence against nationally oppressed groups may get written off as unimportant because the state, culture and identity are all aspects of society's superstructure, which will presumably automatically get fixed by a socialist revolution's transformation of the base's relations of production. In opposition to dialectical materialist analysis, this erroneous mechanical materialist position views the base as the most important principle and decisive force at all times. However, as Mao stated in 1937, when the superstructure, politics, culture, etc. obstructs the development of the economic base, political and cultural changes become principle and decisive. And of course, this theory was proven in practice during the Chinese Revolution when it was shown that transforming the economic base alone was not enough, but that there in fact had to be an active struggle at the superstructural level too, which was put into practice most prominently during the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. So, learning from proletarian revolutionary history, we now know that the struggle for stateless, classless, moneyless society must be waged at the levels of both base and superstructure. This means that it's our duty, as part of the revolutionary struggle to abolish class society, to not only combat the exploitation of labour under the capitalist mode of production at the base, but to also combat modes of oppression like white supremacy and patriarchy which dominate the superstructure. Today we've taken a look at the Marxist analysis of society's division into base and superstructure. We first looked at the economic base, the mode of production comprised of the productive forces and the relations of production. 
We then proceeded to look at the superstructure, which refers to all aspects of society that aren't directly part of the productive process. We then proceeded to look at the dialectical relationship between base and superstructure, highlighting that it's not a one-way relationship, but rather that both influence each other in a reciprocal manner. From this, we were able to see that in order for the proletariat to successfully transition to stateless, classless, moneyless society, it's necessary to not only transform the economic base through socialist revolution, but also to engage in struggle at the superstructural level with ongoing cultural revolution. One last thing to note, while today we've spoken primarily about capitalism, there are generally elements of prior modes of production within all societies. This continues into the socialist transition period where all remnants of class society are completely swept away, bit by bit, until fully classless, communist society is achieved. Right, thanks very much for watching this video, and thanks especially to the supporters on Patreon who've made it possible. Thank you Ian McShay, Ugopnik, Borkir Gorilla, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Madeline, Sonic232, Sagan, Michaela Schmidt, Christian Napales, Brian Roos, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Mekalova, Rock Artist, Grangry, Todd Sprang, Nike the Sage, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Amy Schmidt, Eloy Leslie, Thomas Rossum Wood, Jason Schmidt, Dale Siebold, Train Age 13, Meowsifer, Hunter Johnson, Don Loquishleva, Sixney Veelin, Kale Marx, Roja, MLM in Practice, Eric Lindahl, ZK Goody, Kyle Rapp, Vujko, Doc Toma, Ayob Farah, Becky, Pastor Schubert, A Mouthwash Bottle, Mr. Miyamoto, Kyle King, Reverend Lon Nom Hollywood, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Jose, Joseph Shepard, Jack Schneidman, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, Spoop, and Trailer Park Communist. Cheers everyone, August Slongafoe.